In the second part of this second lecture, we're going to look at some responses to the rationalism empiricism debate from Leibniz and Kant. So if you remember from the last part of the first part, uh, rationalism and empiricism seem to be in direct opposition to each other because Descartes said that the existence of God, for example, could be proved by reason alone, whereas Hume said that such concepts like God can never have any meaning because we can't sense them directly. And then Descartes said we can't trust our senses at all. In fact, we can only trust our mind exists. But Hume said, but the senses are the only thing we actually perceive. The only way to get into the mind is through the senses. So these are really diametrically opposed positions. So how can we go forward from here? Well, Leib Leibniz came along uh, and he uh, he didn't like the idea of a, of a tabula rasa, uh, the blank slate position of the empiricists. And he said, nothing in the mind that has not been in the senses. OK, but the mind itself is is there in the mind. So nothing is in the mind that has not been in the senses except the mind itself. So he thought there must be something in there. That, that's not arrived from the senses. The mind is not just a passive receptacle of information. Rather, it works on and transforms our sensory experiences. So there has to be something in there, some content already, which is against the empirical position. So, criticising this idea of the tabula rasa, Leibniz said instead that we have some innate ideas. And this is an important point, an innate idea, sort of a, a nativist viewpoint. He also said the mind is immaterial, much like Descartes, and that he didn't think there could be any such thing as a thinking physical substance. So you can't create a machine that could perceive or think. So he's, going, he's being a, bit, a little bit dualist there. There's definitely a body and there's the mind and there, the mind is immaterial and the body is material, physical. So in that sense, he's a bit like Descartes. But Leibniz didn't stop there, because he also didn't like some other bits of Descartes' philosophy. For example, he didn't think that all mental states were conscious, so he raised the possibility of unconscious or subconscious mental states. And he also, he's a bit of an animal lover, I guess, so he didn't believe that all animals are automatons, just like uh, Descartes suggested that animals, in fact, had sensations and feelings and souls. Um, humans and man weren't just sort of a special, special case at the top of the, the natural order of things. After Leibniz came Kant, and Leibniz sort of dabbled a bit, but Kant was, has really been uh, attributed with saving the whole of Western philosophy from this existential crisis of empiricism versus rationalism. And he did this by trying to come to a synthesis of these two schools of thought. So he was disturbed by Hume's radical scepticism. And if you remember, Hume was the guy who thought that all we are is just a bundle of sensations, that all there is is sensation and nothing more. There's no mind, there's no self, there's no causality, there's no space, there's no time, there's nothing, nothing at all. And that was a radical, sceptical, empiricist point. And Kant didn't like that. But also Kant didn't like the idea of pure reason, that you know we can generate all of our contents of our minds just by reason alone. And he, he titled his book A Criticism of Pure Reason. So Kant accepted that most experience probably, probably comes from the senses, so that's an empirical view, but he also felt that the mind had to have some sort of innate knowledge, and that's a nativist or, or rationalist view. So Kant, in his large, lengthy, quite dull book, began by assuming that all knowledge does indeed come from experience. And he worked this through, uh, but he realised that it wasn't enough. So some things, uh, like space, time, and cause and effect, we don't actually perceive directly. We know they're there, and we know they exist, and they, these things happen, and somehow these things um, are important in our mind. 
but we don't actually experience them. And in fact, our mind sort of assumes that space and time and cause and effect are, are there. So we don't perceive these things, we assume them. And that was important for Kant. So the second thing that Kant distinguished, and philosophers love to distinguish things, it's one of their main jobs. So Kant distinguished noumena, and I don't know how you say that, which is the universe of, of real things from phenomena, which is our experiences of those same things. And he said that science has got to be about phenomena. We can't experience the noumenal world, that is the world as it really is, because every time we perceive something, our mind is actually constraining and structuring our sensory experience. So space and time and cause and effect are this, this manifold, he called it, and it mediates the world. So it's, a, it's like a, a way of perceiving the world is only, only through our mind. So we can't see the real nature of the world because our mind is limited and structures our experience. And we can't step outside of the mind either. We're stuck with it, unfortunately. So we can't see the noumenal world. Instead, we just have the phenomenal world. So to recap on what's going on here, the rationalists thought that knowledge can be acquired without any experience. You can just sort of reason your way from a priori, first principles, and work out all sorts of stuff. And the empiricist thought that knowledge instead has got to come through experiences and through the senses in this a posteriori, after the fact sort of way. And Kant was a nice guy, so he said, okay, that's fine. But let me bring you another distinction, because I've got to earn my crust as a philosopher. So here's another distinction. And he distinguished between analytic and synthetic knowledge. And this is going to be a bit dull, but it's important to get where we're going. So let's take a look at analytic and synthetic knowledge. Analytic statements are when the thing that is being said in the statement is already contained in the subject that the statement's about. So some examples are, this bachelor is an unmarried man, shock, horror. Um, or the burglar broke into the house. Uh, both of these statements are tautological. They already contain the definition in the second part already in the first part. So a bachelor is by definition an unmarried man and a, and a burglar, burglar is by definition someone who breaks into houses. So these statements are tautological and they're sort of redundant. And the second kind of statement that Kant likes to distinguish are synthetic statements. And these are not tautological. So these statements have a subject, just like the previous ones, but they also give you new information about that subject. So, for example, the dog ate my homework. Now, despite the frequency of this happening, it's not an essential property of dogs that they eat, they always eat homework. So you don't know that. Just by, just by knowing about a dog, you don't know also that they eat homework. So this is an interesting new synthetic statement. The dog ate my homework. Just like lecturers having excellent taste in clothing, it's extremely common for lecturers to have excellent taste in clothing. However, it's not part of the definition itself. There must be some lecturers out there who don't have excellent taste in clothing. So you're learning some information by the, saying the lecturer has excellent taste in clothing. So these synthetic statements are not tautological. They're telling you something new that's not already part of the subject that you're talking about. So, again, I said it was a bit dull, but how does this relate to empiricism versus rationalism? Well, Kant used this distinction to try and define the problem in empiricism and rationalism. So he said that most of the empirical a posteriori knowledge is synthetic. It's new. You can't generate this knowledge from just first principles, from knowing about the, the meanings of the words. Whereas most of the a priori rationalist knowledge is analytic. It's 
it's built up from definitions of things. And so just by looking at the definitions, you can then work out the knowledge. But Kant's genius was to think that maybe there's some synthetic knowledge which is a priori, that is, it's not gained from experience, and it isn't merely a tautology. So what he said, he argued that the things we assume, that our mind assumes in order to perceive the world, so space, time and cause and effect, he assumed that these things are synthetic and a priori bits of knowledge. So they're in our minds, in our brains when we're born. That's the a priori part. But they're also synthetic. They're, they're able to give us new information. And it's new things we didn't, we didn't know already. So these are different from the kinds of facts that empiricists or rationalists would, would talk about. So empiricism can't account for things that are already in your, in your mind. And Kant's, Kant's contribution was to say that the mind has some innate properties that structure our experience. And this is a nativist or rationalist point of view. And this image at the bottom is just showing you that here's a lot of things that Kant sort of described um, quantity and quality and relationships between things and modality. And these are things that the mind sort of has at the beginning and uses these to structure our experience. So Kant's conclusion then was that synthetic a priori constructs of space and time and causality, they're in the mind from the start and they don't exist outside of the mind. And the mind constructs these things in order to structure our, our further experience and knowledge of the world. And if Brian Cox had lived at the same time as Immanuel Kant, Kant would have said to him, the ultimate nature of the universe and reality itself is unknowable. So I need to thank the men who, the great men who contributed to this work, René Descartes, David Hume, Gottfried Leibniz, and Immanuel Kant. And that brings us to the end of the discussion about empiricism versus rationalism, and the end of the Enlightenment, and in the next part we'll be talking about where psychology came from, how it grew out of this argument between empiricism and rationalism, and what happened next. If you have any questions about this topic, you should Write them down and bring them to the Q&A session.